David, I know you never thought you would see the challenges of this pandemic. I talk of the pandemic partition of, say, American inequalities. Tell us the World Bank's pandemic partition. What does it look like? Uh, it's it's the same or worse uh, for developing countries and for poor countries. That takes two. The inequality is is two kind of different factors. One is poor people are 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 worse hit by the global recession, the shutdowns, uh, and and the pandemic <sighs> itself. So they they feel the brunt of that. Uh, and then the second part is that the advanced economies have been doing stimulus programs uh, that cut that concentrate uh, on on people that already have assets. That's the central bank purchases, but it's also the fiscal stimulus from the from the Treasury Department. Uh, David, the focus of the World Bank for years has been on what I would call a third world, a frontier economy. I know those are not correct phrases uh, in 2021. One of the great issues we have is the countability of cases, deaths, and hospitalizations across uh, Africa. Explain the pandemic for Africa right now and the veracity of your data at the World Bank. You know, this is a this is a cloudy area, Tom. The the uh, the death statistics aren't aren't uh, that uh, well kept and aren't that current, and so it's hard to tell how hard COVID is hitting people in Africa. The the original in the in the middle of 2020, there was the the sense that it wasn't hitting as hard. It's different country by country. For example, South Africa has been hard hit, uh, but uh, uh, other countries seeming to be less. So, but now our sense is that it's that it's spreading and hitting hitting all countries. What we want to do on vaccines uh, is uh, have vaccines available for everyone, uh, including and especially the poor. And so that's that's one of the challenges to have systems that can actually deliver enough vaccines. That's exactly where I wanted to go, especially given some of the delays that we've seen in the developed world. How worried are you about the time frame for distributing the vaccine? in the developing world. Hi, Lisa. What, what the World Bank has done, we, pa we passed in October a $12 billion package uh, through the board uh, and that's available. And our, the first step is to assess countries and see what they need in terms of a cold chain, in terms of uh, identifying the people that need the vaccine the most. So that work is underway in 100 countries. Uh, and then the next step is actual contracts. One of the challenges is to have a common contract uh, where where people can uh, where people can see the the, uh, uh, the 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 same terms and and actually operate on them uh, and so we're working on that and then another uh, another immediate problem is indemnification Pfizer has been hesitant to go into some of the countries because of the uh, uh, liability um, problems or they don't have a liability shield so we work with the countries to try to do that but I think also some of the other vaccines manufacturers may be able to uh, go into countries because they're operating through subsidiaries. Th this is all something that we're exploring. And our goal, my goal, is to have vaccines available for people throughout the developing world based on what their countries decide. We've got financing available, uh, but the, the, the countries need to choose systems and then begin uh, buying or, or receiving the vaccines. We're speaking with David Malpass, World Bank president. David, uh, you talk about how the programs that have salvaged the global economy have really benefited the wealthiest individuals who have assets, not so much people at the bottom. And this has to do with the economies as well. How worried are you about the overhang of debt in the emerging world as we do get this ongoing economic pain without a vaccine distribution model that seems to be uh, taking course quickly enough for many people's tastes? Uh, it's it's challenging to keep private sectors open. What we've tried to do through the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, the private sector arm of the World Bank, is to provide working capital uh, and trade finance so that the private sectors that do operate in poor countries uh, can continue to uh, to to operate. <clears throat> But a challenge in the world, in it, with given that interest rates are low for a long period of time, and that's being accomplished in part 
by uh, by borrowing short term and having the governments invest long term. Think think about that. The 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 central banks borrow overnight money and put it into long term bonds. That disadvantages the small businesses mm -hmm. because they need that money. The overnight money is what they live on in terms of working capital. Uh, and so it's not just in the developing world, but in the advanced economies, the uh, the dichotomy, the inequality that comes out of that is a big challenge because you're losing the small business sector of the world. David Malpass, I've got to digress to U.S. politics. You were, of course, provided public service to the nation working for President Trump. I believe now there's going to be a new relationship of your World Bank and President Biden, of course, the International Monetary Fund, Kitty Corner to you there, uh, to the west of the White House. David Malpass, how do you adapt, adjust, or you're oblivious to a new U.S. administration? Uh, not oblivious. Uh, the U.S. is our biggest shareholder, so we're very aware of what their their interests and goals are, as we are of other countries, the developing countries included. You know, we one of the big voices within the World Bank is the voice of the developing countries through our board of directors. So we listen to all parties, and we've been successful in the past in working across the aisle in 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 all of the major uh, shareholders. So I expect that to continue. One area that uh, uh, that where where the U.S. I think will be supportive uh, of the uh, of the uh, climate uh, policies of the World Bank. You know, the World Bank is the biggest uh, fin uh, international financier of of climate uh, change uh, activities. For example, in the poorer nations, they need to adapt uh, to to climate changes, uh, and and w we we put a lot of funding into that. So I think we'll see strong support from the U.S. on that kind of uh, agenda as well. So I'm looking forward to working with the new uh, with the new administration. Uh, but we're we're non-political, so uh, we we I, I want to see people in developing countries do better. That's the that's the goal and the mission. Well, when you talk about being apolitical, it still puts you into a somewhat sensitive place a lot of the time. And I'm thinking of some of your comments about China and how they hadn't been aggressive enough, in your view, with debt relief for poor nations, given their primary role over the past few years, extending debt to these countries. Do you feel like they have gotten better with debt relief? Has your view changed at all over the recent months? Uh, th well, they've been uh, changing, um, and and they're a full participant in the G20, the group of 20 uh, major economies. And so during 2020, uh, I was happy to see, you, you know, I, I went forward along with Kristalina at the uh, IMF uh, with the idea that there should be uh, a moratorium on the payments by the poorest countries to their creditors, the official bilateral creditors, of which China is the largest, mm -hmm. and also the private sector creditors. So China... Uh, subscribe to that and and uh, is is uh, trying to move in that direction so I don't see that there'll be a change in that I think the big countries want to find a way to uh, work on this debt overhang it's 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 uh, it, right. it, it, it's very worrisome because it's hard to invest into a poor country if uh, that if so much of their resources are having to go to right. repay past debt David Malpass folks has one of the most famous charts in the history of everything I've done, and that is gold and yen terms. We're not going to ask him for a market call as president of the World Bank, but I am, David, going to link it into your knowledge at the World Bank about the commodity nations. Can you call a turn for the beleaguered commodity nations? Are they finally going to see a bid on their various commodities? Tom, this is a core, you know, we have our new global economic prospects report that just came out yesterday. So we address the, some of the, some of the outlook or the forecast. Uh, but w one of the, one of the unknowns, I think, is as the central banks have uh, created stimulus, what, what's the mechanism for that? You know, my view is it, ha it is not money printing that they're doing. What they're doing is buying duration. So they, they borrow short term and buy long term assets. That by itself itself is not inflationary. Uh, and the, the forecasts that people have of the inflation outlook still don't show that there would be inflation. So uh, I'm, a concern for commodity producers is they do better in a red hot world, you know, where there's, yep. where there's uh, inflationary pressures. Uh, and right now, I'm, I'm worried about 
uh, or my, I, I think the bigger challenge is to get enough GDP growth, meaning nominal, de, nominal supply, the production side of the global economy, mm. up and running and recovering. 